It's my pleasure to welcome you students that are with us and you who are joining us online to another installment of our Rare Book Room Lectures. We're here on the campus of Reformation Bible College. We are in our wonderful library here on campus. Uh, just over to my right is our Rare Book Room. It's a beautiful room full of all kinds of treasures, and I'd love to show all of you that room. And if you're ever able to get to us on campus, uh, we'd give you a great tour of that. You could see the treasures that we have in there. Uh, through the course of these rare book room lectures, we've been highlighting some of the Bibles that we have in that collection. Uh, we've been highlighting some of the classic texts, even some early texts by John Calvin and some of the reformers. Uh, this time we get to do something very special. Uh, we are moving away from books and texts, and we are going to pottery. In fact, we are going to hear a lecture uh, from Dr. John Currid on pots, pottery, and purpose. And we're going to be looking at the relationship of archaeology and the Old Testament. Well, we have a number of pieces of pottery in our collection, and I brought out a few just to show you. Uh, we have a number of uh, vases that go back to the second millennia BC. We have a number of oil lamps. This is a, an, an early BC oil lamp, and you can sort of see the simple technology behind it. And as you move into the first century AD, uh, you've seen how the technology advanced and evolved into this form of the oil lamp. But we know how Scripture speaks of oil lamps, and this is one of them. Uh, I think we like these things, pottery, vases, and oil lamps, uh, because they show us that the Bible took place in real places, in real time, with real people that used real objects. Uh, one of those objects, and it's, it's my favorite collection of our pottery, is this. Now, it's very heavy, and it is a mortar and pestle, and it dates to 4,000 B.C. And it's for grinding herbs or grinding grain. Now, you might be familiar with the Bishop Usher's dates. And uh, Bishop Usher was in the time of the Reformation, and those dates made their way into the King James Bible. But Bishop Usher dated the Garden of Eden to 4004 B.C. So because that is 4000 B.C., we affectionately call that Eve's herb grinder here at RBC, and so we have it. Well, I want to introduce to you our speaker. We're going to be hearing in a moment from Dr. John Currid. He is the Chancellor's Professor of Old Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary. He received his master's degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, then a PhD from the very prestigious Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. He taught first at Grove City College in Pennsylvania, uh, not too far from the original Ligonier Valley Study Center uh, there in Western PA. And then for over 25 years, he's been at Reformed Theological Seminary. He taught at Jackson, Mississippi, the campus there, and he taught RBC's very own Dr. John Tweedale. He also went on to teach at the Charlotte campus and now serves as the Chancellor's Professor. He is an archaeologist. He has served in excavations at Carthage and at Bethsaida, and he was the director of the Lahav Grain Storage Project, and he's also an author of many books. He's written a number of commentaries on the Old Testament. I'd recommend all of them to you, but a number of books on the history, culture of the Old Testament and archaeology. Uh, one is this book, Against the Gods, so the Old Testament and its cultural context. This one, Ancient Egypt and the Old Testament, which I believe goes back to your dissertation studies even, and a long time interest for you. And if you have any interest in archaeology, I'd recommend that you start with this book. It is The Case for Biblical Archaeology, Uncovering the Historical Record of God's Old Testament People. In addition to these many books that he's written, he's also the senior editor of this, which is, this is one of my favorite study Bibles. I love digging into this thing. It's the Archaeology Study Bible. And so he served as a senior editor, editor of it. It is a treasure trove of information. 
and then everybody should have a big atlas at their disposal. And so he is also the author of the ESV Bible Atlas. Well, it's a real pleasure for us to have Dr. John Currid come and deliver our rare book room lecture. Dr. Currid, welcome to our campus. Thank you. It's good to have you, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nichols. Welcome, and uh, it's good to see all of you here. It's uh, a real joy to, to be with you. This is my first time on the campus, though I teach at RTS Orlando every January. Uh, that's how I get out of the Indiana winters, is to come down at that time. Uh, I've written a lot for Table Talk uh, and for Ligonier uh, and on this very topic of archaeology. And in fact, uh, this fall, the Table Talk issue will be on, on archaeology. So it's something really to look forward to. This is sort of an anniversary for me. I don't mean wedding anniversary. If it was, I'd really be in trouble. Uh, but it's an anniversary for me in this sense that 50 years ago, I participated in my first excavation in the land of Israel. I look out there and I'm going, they're not even 25 years old, a lot of these uh, uh, people here this, this afternoon. And 50 years ago, I started excavating in Israel. The name of the site was Tel Kassila, not a very well-known site, but it's an ancient Philistine site that's located within the bustling metropolis of Tel Aviv. It was really quite ironic. We would go out each morning, and here we're digging this ancient mound, and skyscrapers were being built around us as we were uh, excavating uh, this uh, particular site. It was quite paradoxical. In my uh, excavation area, there were four of us working in that area. We discovered the first remains of a now famous Philistine temple when we uncovered two pillar bases that stood in the main hall of the building. These two pillar bases were about 10 feet apart and they would have supported two large wooden pillars and those pillars in turn would have held up uh, a second story and the roof of the temple complex. Here we are, these young diggers, we were all around 20 years old and uh, in our area, and, and, uh, and we will never forget uh, when uh, Ami Mazar, who was the archeological director of the site, announced to us, you have just discovered the Philistine temple. It was then that I was bitten by the proverbial archeological bug. There were four of us in that excavation area Three of us now are trained archaeologists. It was because we found that temple. Now, this was an important discovery, uh, not only for the understanding of Philistine temple architecture, but it also helped us understand the story of the death of Samson in the book of Judges. Remember, after the ca capture of Samson by the Philistines, they paraded him into the temple of Dagon in their capital city of Gaza. This can be found in Judges chapter 16. Mocking Samson, the Philistines made him stand between the two foundational pillars of the temple. Judges chapter 16, verse 25. And you remember when Samson pushed on the two pillars, the entire edifice collapsed, including the roof, and killed uh, many of the spectators. The archaeological finds in the Philistine temple at Tel Kassila help us to understand that the events related in the Bible, in the Samson story, actually took place uh, in a historical framework, actually took place in space and uh, time. It was in a cultural framework of approximately 1200 B.C. See, archaeology can enlighten us regarding many aspects of daily life in biblical times. It provides an earthiness to Scripture. Let me say that again. It provides an earthiness to Scripture. Another example may be helpful. In Jeremiah chapter 7, 30 through 32, we read the following. 
For the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house that is called by my name to defile it. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no more be called Tophet, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tophet, because there is no room elsewhere. Now, as we read that in Jeremiah chapter 7, you may be asking yourself, well, what in the world is that word, Tophet? Well, the term Tophet in the Hebrew Bible uh, is a place of child sacrifice and burial. So God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is complaining that during the history of Judah, the kings of Judah had been sacrificing their children in the Tophet outside of Jerusalem. Now, some archaeologists, some historians would argue that there is little or no archaeological evidence for child sacrifice in ancient Israel or Judah or throughout the rest of the ancient Near East. However, Beginning in uh, the 1970s, an American excavation team from the University of Chicago began working at the site of Carthage in modern Tunisia. Now, if you want to know where Carthage is, you need to, somebody stole my atlas. You need to get the atlas to know where Carthage is in uh, North Africa. Uh, beginning uh, uh, at that time, and it's, the excavations are still going on today, in the 1980s, I was one of the field directors at the site, Carthage was founded by the Phoenicians in the 8th century BC. Now, do you know who the Phoenicians are? This is why you need to get an atlas. Uh, the Phoenicians were next door neighbors to Israel, and they had great influence upon Israelite life and uh, religion. Jezebel, that vile toad on the throne of Israel, the wife of Ahab, was a Phoenician. It was her people that founded Carthage uh, as a colony in the 8th century uh, BC. And in our excavations at Carthage, we uncovered a tophet, that is, a cemetery bearing the remains of children who had been ritually sacrificed as burnt offerings to the gods. Now, if, as we theorize, that, that, that it is a child sacrificial cemetery, and it's the largest one ever found, it had a continuous use of 800 years, or 600 years, from 800 B.C. to the destruction of Carthage in 146 B.C. Now, the precise boundaries of the Tophet precinct are unknown because uh, modern housing occupies some of the cemetery. You can get that real estate real cheap. Uh, you have babies buried under your house. Uh, but it's been estimated that the minimum size, and in my opinion, a conservative estimate, is 60,000 square feet, the size of the Tophet which equals approximately two football fields. The number of children in the cemetery is also unknown, although a conservative estimate is 20,000 burials between the years 400 to 200 BC, which is only a third of the use of the cemetery. Now that the Phoenicians, next door neighbors to Israel, practiced child sacrifice was well known and attested to in antiquity. For example, the Greek author Clitarchus, at the close of the 4th century BC, commented, he said this, out of reverence for Baal, the Phoenicians, and especially the Carthaginians, where whenever they seek to obtain some great favor, vow one of their children, burning it as a sacrifice to the deity, if they are especially eager to gain success. 
There stands in their midst a bronze statue of Baal, its hands extended over a bronze brazier, the flames of which engulf the child. When the flames fall on the body, the limbs contract, and the open mouth uh, seems almost to be laughing until the contracted body slips quietly into the brazier. They call this the act of laughing. Clitarchus lived when Carthage was in existence. So he's a contemporary of Carthaginian society. And so his uh, uh, works uh, hold great weight uh, in the truth of what was going on there at Carthage. There are numerous other ancient authors as well who make mentions of Carthaginian child sacrifice, such as Diodorus Siculus and Plutarch, but they are after the destruction of Carthage in 146 BC. In any event, what we see at Carthage through archaeology, through excavation work, is that child sacrifice was a dominant aspect of Phoenician colonial culture and that it was well known throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. This gives some weight and sway to the reality that the kings of Israel and Judah both participated in it during the reigns of wicked kings over God's people. You can also go to uh, texts like Leviticus chapter 19 that talks about Canaanite culture, and at the head of the list is child sacrifice. So on the part of the Israelite kings, the Judean kings, there was accommodation or acculturation to these practices of uh, the Phoenicians. Now what I'm getting at with, with uh, those stories of Tel Kassila and then at Carthage, is that uh, the weight of archaeological research is that it deals with the very physical nature of things, and therefore it grounds us <clears throat> in what the Latins call the realia, the, uh, the real things of, of ancient life. Again, it demonstrates the earthiness of the scriptures and how the episodes of the Bible occurred in time and place and history. It provides us with insight into daily living. And let me give you a more recent example is that uh, I've been on the archaeological staff at Bethsaida since uh, the mid-1990s. Bethsaida is, a, is an important New Testament site uh, right on the Sea of Galilee. It was the home of three of the disciples. Uh, Peter, Andrew, and Philip were from Bethsaida. And the excavation field that I was in charge of uh, was uh, the domestic quarter of the New Testament city. There we uncovered uh, housing uh, from the New Testament period, grain storage facilities, and lots of tools. We found uh, uh, agricultural implements such as uh, sickles and hoes and long nails and other uh, hand tools. The largest amount of small finds, however, were fishing paraphernalia. Hooks and uh, weights and so forth and, and so on. And that makes a lot of sense since the name of the city Bethsaida means house of the fishermen. It also fits because Peter and Andrew were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. Okay, you see how all that works together. So we didn't, in all our excavations there, the many years we worked there, we did not find at the site anything specifically about Peter, Andrew, and uh, Philip. Uh, I used to have students, uh, volunteers, they'd say to me, ah, maybe, maybe we're digging in Peter's house. And I'd say, well, if you can find a mailbox with the name Peter, and Andrew on it, maybe, maybe you've got something there. But what were we doing in our excavation of, of this area is to try and, and get material to help us understand what it would have been like 
to be a fisherman living at Bethsaida in the first century A.D. What it would have been like uh, to be a fisherman uh, during the time of Christ and his ministry there in, uh, in, in Galilee. Now, archaeology does more than this, however. It does more than merely place things in their physical setting. That's helpful. But it can also uh, help to set the narratives of the Bible in their historical context. Now, you may not think this is an important idea, but I want to argue that this thought is crucial for our day and age. We live in an age in which many people believe that history is meaningless, that it's irrelevant and has no application to how we are to live today. Common thinking today, we might define it as ahistoricism. And that ahistoricism <clears throat> is a foundational tenet to post-Christian thought. History has no meaning is what we are told today. Many academics argue that there's no such thing as true history. History, in other words, is based on writings that purport to record history, but they are merely agenda-driven documents of propaganda. I'm sure you've run across this type of thinking. The lens of history today and its interpretation is what Carl Truman calls expressive individualism, in which people define what is real based upon their own individual psychological core. But that view is forgetful of the historical and physical realia. Because archaeology deals with material remains, that is, physical objects set in place and time. And therefore, it is a weapon to be used against expressive individualism. Whether an individual exists or not, these material remains exist. They are real. Whether you exist or not, that pot does. It's real, it's true, it's physical. <clears throat> now, in regard, uh, in that regard, let me ask you a question. It's a rhetorical question, and that is, what is the most prolific object discovered through excavation of a site? By far, the answer is to my left, is pottery. It is everywhere. It is ubiquitous. It is durable. It is everywhere in every uh, level of, uh, of a site. It's found by the bucketful in every layer of a site. It's interesting when you uh, have volunteers come and on the first day of excavation, student volunteers, oh man, they're so excited when, when, when they find pottery shirts. But the excitement wanes day after day. And it gets to the point where they go, another pottery shirt, because they are everywhere. I remember when my nephew uh, was uh, uh, opening his Christmas presents, and the first present he got was, was a slinky. Remember slinkies? They go downstairs, you know? He said, oh, great, a slinky. He opened up a present from someone else. It was a slinky. And he went, another slinky, and threw it over his head. See, that's what happens with student volunteers on excavation sites. Another piece of pottery. Am I going to find another piece of pottery? Yes. Pottery, however, may not be exciting, but it is important. It is found in every layer of a site, and its style changes from layer to layer. And so it is the fundamental tool of archaeology for dating. Each level has a different type of pottery, and we're able to date layers based upon that. Yet, in my view, there is something even more important about pottery at a base level. It's real. 
It's made of clay. It's here, there, and everywhere. It highlights the earthiness of what we do. That is real. It's clay. It comes from the ground. You can't deny that. Just because your psychological core says this is a dog doesn't make it a dog. It's a piece of pottery that's been around for thousands of years. So you can say what you want, but pottery is real and true and not dependent on our own individual psychological core. Now, don't get me wrong. This does not mean that archaeological research has not been affected by modern prog progressivism, because it has. There's a recent movement in both the fields of anthropology and archaeology that when one finds a dead body, whether a skeleton or a mummy or whatever, that one should not publish the gender identity of the deceased because we don't know how that person identified its own gender in antiquity. Plus, you're getting professors who are teaching that you can't distinguish between male and female bone structure of ancient humans. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. That's certainly untrue. So in the academic world, archaeologists and others must embrace fields such as post-colonial thought, feminism, gender and queer politics, anti-racism, racism, and so forth. If not, <clears throat> then they are ostracized uh, or can easily be canceled. It's interesting what this has led to, and what it's led to is uh, anonymous internet publications of archaeologists who they don't give their names, but they give their research. They practice their craft anonymously so they won't get canceled. That's kind of where we're headed in a lot of fields today. But for those of us who are Christians, it's critical for us not to give in to a historicism. History is a pillar of scripture and the Christian worldview. God is a God of history. God created history. And time is moving historically from creation to consummation. Creation, fall, redemption, glorification is both a theological and historical construct. And the biblical writers knew this well. In 1 Corinthians 15, for example, Paul argues that if Christ has not been historically raised from the dead in time and in history, then we are of all people most to be pitied. If the resurrection was not a historical reality, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Here is a hill for the believer to stand on and to die on. Don't listen to what the culture is teaching you. Listen to what scripture is teaching you and what reality is teaching you. Another aspect of this issue we are dealing uh, with today is that we cannot assume that people are biblically and historically informed. More so today than any time in our history as a nation is the reality that people are uninformed uh, of such things. Most Americans today cannot name the four Gospels. One third of Americans believe that Billy Graham gave the Sermon on the Mount. So an important purpose of the study of archaeology and its relationship to the Bible is to help us become informed literate and mature in our knowledge of the scriptures. 
We must compel this age to learn God's word and to honor Christ. Now, let me give you an example of how archaeology can enlighten our understanding uh, of, of the scriptures. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 15, in the story of Rahab, we read this curious statement. It says this, Then uh, she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. Now, the configuration of outer city walls surrounding ancient cities varied from period to period. During Rahab's time in the late Bronze Age, many Canaanite cities had uh, thick, uh, solid uh, walls, uh, fortification walls that surrounded their particular cities. But through excavation, we also know that some of the cities had what is called a casemate wall system. A casemate wall was not a solid wall surrounding the city, but it was formed by two parallel walls encircling the city with periodic perpendicular walls that created rooms in which people could live. Now, in times of war, in times of siege, uh, these double outer walls were filled in with boulders, and this would make the outer wall of the city very thick. But when these rooms were empty, people used them as back rooms to their houses. And thus we understand it is likely that Rahab, just as the book of Joshua says, did indeed live in the wall of the city, the city of Jericho. Now, earlier in the account, Rahab is pictured as hiding the two Israelite spies uh, on, on the roof of her house under stalks of flax that she had laid down on her roof. Now you think about it, it's curious, uh, isn't it? Uh, what, what was she doing exactly? But archaeologists have uncovered many houses from this time that have staircases on the outside of the house that lead to the roof of the house, to a flat roof on the house. And just like today in villages in Israel, the roof in ancient times was used for drying foods in the sun. What Rahab had on her roof was common for the day and uh, would not have raised suspicion from authorities. It would have been a perfect place to hide the Israelite spies, and thus they went undetected. Uh, these are examples from Jericho, how archaeology can help us and enlighten our understanding of difficult biblical texts. See, that's the primary purpose of archaeology, to enlighten us, to give us understanding of Scripture. Now, tried and true uh, archaeological research uh, of the Bible also fortifies us against falling prey to such things as what I call pop archaeology. What do I mean by that? Well, it receives a lot of press, pop archaeology, announcing these staggering uh, discoveries such as the Ark of the Covenant with blood still on it, uh, the Egyptian chariot wheels in the Red Sea, Noah's house, somebody's found, or the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. On and on and on. You'll get these, people say they found these things. Now, the purported stunning find has a long history in the church. We're drawn to these things because we live by sight, right? So we're drawn to those. For example, uh, in the early 4th century A.D., Constantine's mother, Helena, declared that she had discovered the true cross uh, in Jerusalem. She's the first pop archaeologist. It's now commemorated, for any of you who've been to Israel, it's now commemorated in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. But many others throughout church history have made the same claim. No, that wasn't a cross. I found the cross. Or someone else, oh, I found the cross. No, I found the cross. Even Erasmus, the 16th century Catholic, Catholic priest and famed humanist, he was suspicious. He said this, 
So they say the cross of our Lord, which is shown publicly and privately in so many places, that if all the fragments were collected together, they would appear to form a fair cargo for a merchant ship. Or as Luther is purported to have claimed, there's uh, enough uh, wood of uh, the true cross that we could build Noah's Ark. Now, most of the claims of pop archaeology have been debunked, and so the church, we need to train our people, we need to train people in our church, our congregants, to, and, and to educate them uh, not to fall for uh, charlatans, not to fall for that stunning uh, find. Uh, whenever I, I speak on, on this topic, uh, on archaeology, uh, rarely I'm not asked, uh, uh, do you know where Noah's Ark is? And I go, yes, Genesis 6 through 9. <laughs> yes, I do. No, I don't know where the physical Ark is. I was once asked by James Irwin, you should know that name, a, an astronaut who landed on the moon. He asked if I would uh, go with his expedition to find the Ark. And I said, no, I'd sooner go to the moon with you than go find Noah's Ark. So no, I did not participate in that. The truth is, we do not need to grasp for the, for the spectacular find because archaeological, true archaeological research has provided us with many important solid finds that help us understand the Bible. Many of these discoveries are not well known by people in the church, certainly not uh, in society in, in general. So what I want to do for the remainder of our, our lecture time uh, here this afternoon is I want to look at a few of the most recent tried and true archaeological work that has truly illumined our understanding of Scripture and helped to set the narratives of the Bible in their proper historical setting. I'm going to look at three uh, recent finds. During the Iron I period, now we're talking 1200 to 1000 BC when Israel was continuing its settlement in the land of Canaan, there have been found no temples within Israelite contexts of the period. Some archaeologists, however, have proposed that some religious shrines do appear throughout the land, but they're not full-fledged temple complexes. In the 1980s, Adam Zertal discovered a good example of a shrine from this time on the slopes of Mount Ebal, and he identified it with the altar that Joshua set up to renew the covenant uh, recorded in Joshua chapter 8. Now, not everyone agrees with this identification, but it seems to me it's a, it's a, it's a fairly solid uh, identification. Recently, a team went back to the site, and what they did is they spent their time sifting through the soil dumps or the earth dumps of Zertal's excavations. In other words, when you're digging a site and you go down, you pull out all this earth and you throw it into a dump. Okay, so uh, the, this team went back and began sifting all of Zertal's uh, 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 earth that he had dumped out of the excavations. In 2019, and just announced in 2022, that team discovered a lead tablet that is one square inch in size that contains four lines of text, consi uh, text consisting of 40 letters. It was written in early alphabetic Hebrew script. And it's been translated by the archaeologists as follows. Cursed, 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 cursed by the God Yahweh. You will die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die. Cursed by Yahweh. Cursed, cursed, cursed. 
Well, the writer, he knew one word pretty well, didn't he? Cursed. This is obviously this uh, uh, inscription is some type of legal covenantal text that contains a curse invoking the name of Yahweh. And of course, that would fit with the context of Joshua chapter 8, where they go and on one mountain, or uh, the, the half tribes of Israel sing forth the blessings, the other half sing forth the curses, okay? So it would fit well with all of that. And if this find uh, proves to be genuine, which, which I, I believe it will, uh, although the original inscription hasn't been published yet, it hasn't been studied by the academic community, uh, I think if this is true, which I think it, it will be shown to be, it is very important. First, it is likely that it is the earliest reference to the name Yahweh found in ancient Israel. That's really important. We're talking 1200 BC. And secondly, try and get this argument. Biblical uh, academia for decades has argued that parts of the Hebrew Bible, such as the Pentateuch, could not have been written in the second millennium BC, because the Hebrew language had not sufficiently developed during this time. Well, we're learning more and more that that's not the case at all. And if this inscription at Mount Ebal is genuine and accurately dates to 1200 BC, then we have further evidence for an early development of the Hebrew language. Second, uh, find. In 2016, at the site of Lachish, which is in the foothills of Israel, excavators found an ivory comb with an inscription on it. The comb was made of elephant ivory. It was a valuable object in antiquity because at that time there were no elephants in the land of of Israel, and therefore the piece must have been imported. It perhaps came from Egypt, where such types of combs are well known in antiquity. The comb is an interesting ivory piece. It has uh, teeth on both sides of the comb. One, was, one side was for untangling knots in a person's hair, and the other side was used to remove lice and eggs from the hair. Now we know that, you're kind of, that's pretty gross, but we know that uh, because through microscopic analysis, remains of head lice were found on the comb. We also know its purpose from the inscription which was carved on the comb. The incision was a mere seven words with a total of 17 letters written in the Canaanite language. And what it says is this, may this tusk Root out the lice of the hair and the beard. We have a pretty good idea its purpose, don't we? Now, what's interesting about that, uh, that find, is the archaeologists, through paleographic analysis and other means, determined that the comb and its inscription date to the Middle Bronze II period, which is between 1700 and 1550 B.C., this is several hundred years before the Israelites, as a people, entered into the land of Canaan. That dating is important because no Canaanite or Hebrew inscription has been found in the land in good context before the 13th century BC. This script, inscription, therefore, predates any other inscriptional, inscriptional material in those languages by at least 300 years. Why is this important? It's the same argument I just used on the last relic. Again, it is often argued that the Pentateuch could not have been written in the second millennium BC by Moses or anyone else because Hebrew had not yet come into existence or had time to develop fully. But the reality is this. The Canaanite language and the Hebrew language are interrelated. 
In fact, uh, when I looked at the Lachish inscription on the ivory comb, I was able to read it immediately because much of the Canaanite vocabulary on the, on the comb is the same as Hebrew vocabulary. And so, the language of Canaanite Hebrew writing was in the land of Canaan at least two to three centuries before the time of Moses. If you look at the more liberal and moderate commentators or archaeologists or historians, they believe that nobody could really write in the second millennium BC. But now we're able to take it back all the way uh, to as far back as 1700 BC. All right, let me give you one more and then we'll, we'll close some things up here. In 1979, the Israeli archaeologist Gabriel Barquet was excavating an Iron Age burial cave at the site of Ketef Hinnom, which is located just southwest of the city of Jerusalem. The tomb was a typical late Iron Age burial chamber dating to the late 7th century BC. So it was Judean. It was from the time of the Judean kings. And the typical Judean burial at this time took place in a rock-cut rock cave, and it was a familial tomb. When a person died, uh, they would take he or she uh, and place uh, the, the, the body on a burial bench in the tomb, accompanied with personal items such as pottery, vases, jewelry, and trinkets. Once the body decayed, the bones of the person were taken off the bench and placed in a repository beneath the burial bench with other bones of deceased that had preceded them in death. It's like you're being joined to the bones of the fathers. Okay? So familial, down through the centuries, your family dies and you put them in these caves, the, the meat uh, 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 rots off of the bones, they take the bones and place them uh, underneath uh, the burial bench. Now, when the team began to excavate the repository, they came upon two small silver scrolls. And since the scrolls were metal, the archaeologists had a difficult time unrolling and deciphering the text on each scroll. They began with the larger of the two scrolls, and it took three years to unroll it. When unrolled, it only measured about three inches long. And when they finished unrolling it, they noticed that the scroll was covered with very delicately etched characters. The first word they were able to decipher was the name Yahweh. After much work, they were able to read the entire miniature scroll, and it contained the priestly benediction from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The smaller scroll also contained the priestly benediction from Numbers chapter 6. It took so long to unroll and decipher the two scrolls that the material was not published until 1989. These two scrolls are relatively unknown, although they can be seen today in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, and they are very uh, important. First, they are the earliest known citations of biblical texts in Hebrew that have been found. They predate the earliest Dead Sea Scrolls by more than 400 years. And so they are helpful in matters of textual criticism. Secondly, and I'm getting back to this point again I made with the first two, and that is many source critics throughout the years had regarded the priestly benediction to be from the so-called P source. Do you know what I mean by that? The JEDP theory, there are all these different sources coming in that give us the Old Testament. And the P source is called the priestly source, and scholars believe the priestly source uh, to be a very late addition uh, to uh, the five books of Moses. Many commentators argue that the priestly benediction was written in the post-exilic period, 
after the destruction of the temple, and its earliest date may have been in the 4th century B.C. But wait a minute. We've got realia. We have in our hands physical, material examples of the benediction found in a certain context of the late 7th century B.C. and in a context that perhaps reflects common usage of the time. And it is in the context of the Old Testament in which Judah and Jerusalem are thriving Hebrew enclaves. And it is before the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. The discovery of these two miniature scrolls with the same benediction in a repository, repository where the bones of many people were buried finally underscores the centrality of the priestly benediction to the religion of the Israelites. May the Lord bless you and keep you. When I uh, was a PhD student in archaeology at the University of Chicago, my thesis advisor came to me one day and he said that he had a donor uh, that had presented a proposal to him. Uh, the donor wanted to fund fully an expedition to the land of Moab to find the bones of Moses that the Lord had buried there before the Israelites crossed into the land of promise. My advisor, this will tell you a lot, uh, said that he immediately thought of me to lead the expedition because he knew I had a high view of the Bible. He was honest with me, however, and said he knew I wouldn't find anything, but that I would get experience in leading an expedition. But I turned down the offer. Because I read Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 through 6. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows the place of his burial to this day. I figured that if the Israelites didn't know where Moses was buried, then I had no chance of discovering it at all. See, we need not go for the sensational or the spectacular find. We need to depend on tried and true archaeological work to reveal ruins and finds that can help illuminate and give earthiness to the scriptures. Well, I have two words for you, Dr. Curd. One is, here's your atlas <laughs> back. <laughs> and secondly, thank you. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to reset here to get some questions from the students and hopefully some answers from you. And we'll be right back. Well, welcome back. We do have a few questions ready. And our, our first question comes from started off as an online student, but Andrew has joined us on campus this year. So your question, Andrew. So Dr. Kirid, since we're not looking for sensational archaeological finds like the bones of Moses, the Ark of the Covenant, the cross of Christ, and we're looking for artifacts that are of more of an earthy nature that brings us into the biblical text, what would be something of that nature that would be a cool find for us to have? It's a good question. Um, at the excavations of Hatsor, you know that site, Hatsor, north of the Sea of Galilee, uh, the archaeologist there believes there is a Israelite uh, monarchic library at that site. They haven't found it yet, but they found uh, one or two clay tablets that indicate that it might in fact be there. And that's what we really need. We don't have a lot of inscriptional, mater inscriptional material from either Israel or Judah. We have some, but not a lot. And that would be really good. Now, I'm, worse to, I'm also used to working in Egypt. A lot of my work is there. We have so much written material, we can't even translate it all. But the opposite's true of, of Israel. Um, Israel, they were more 
don't take this wrong, but they were more hillbilly. Okay, uh, Egypt would be seen as, you know, the Boston of antiquity where there was a university on every street corner. They were doing brain surgery. They were doing all sorts of things in ancient Egypt. The Israelites were living up in the hills uh, in, uh, in, in Canaan. So to find something like that would be a great find. Of course, probably the greatest find ever, of course, in Israel are the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the, you get stuff in writing. That's really what you want to see. And if you note that all three of the uh, the finds, the discoveries I talked about today were all inscriptional. Writing is really important when it comes to archaeology. But thank you for that question. Why would it have taken so long to open the Silver Scrolls? Uh, that's a great science question that uh, I probably don't know the full answer to it. They, they had f fear of destroying it if they went to quickly. And so I don't know all the scientific stuff of the alloys and all that kind of stuff, but uh, it was a scientific exercise that took them that long to do it because they were very, being very cautious and slow not to destroy anything that was within them. So that's about the best answer I, get, I can give you. I mean, my best answer to that is I have no idea. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. In regards to your excavation of the Philistine temple, was there anything reminiscent or similar to the judge's narrative? Uh, the, the, the main point would be what I said, the two pillars which held up the entire temple, and then we see that in the story of Samson at Gaza. I think there's also some relationship to the Israelite temple because you have uh, the two main pillars, the Boaz and can't remember the name of the other one that held up the, the temple in, in Jerusalem as well. It's not that the Israelites borrowed from the Philistines or anything like that, but I think it was like common uh, temple architecture of that time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Curd. That was the last of our questions, and we have a gift for you before you head off. This is a leaf mm -hmm. from a Geneva Bible wow. that was printed in 1577. Wow. And it is from Second Chronicles, but what makes uh, this leaf special is it says up at the top, the Ark of the Covenant. Wow. Great. So we know where the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant is. is. It's, it's right here. It's right. It's in Second Chronicles. So, thanks yeah, again thanks for being you. with us. This is yeah, a real privilege. Thank pleasure. you very much. Join with me in just thanking Dr. Currid for spending this time with us. Well, that concludes our Rare Book Room lecture. We'll be back shortly with another lecture, and we'd love to have you join us again. Thanks so much.